Today, we're taking a look at the de Havilland DH-108 Swallow, a plane that was as innovative as it was dangerous. It was a supersonic jet that did much for the development of Cold War aircraft in Great Britain. In fact, it was the first British jet to break the sound barrier, but its tragic history has often overshadowed its accomplishments. The development of the Swallow can be traced back to the Second World War. As early as 1942, steps were being taken to ensure that the British aircraft industry, which had grown considerably during the war, would still have a good supply of work, and thus maintain a large number of jobs, once the war was over. This resulted in the formation of the Brabazon Committee, the goal of which was to investigate the needs of a post-war civil airline market in both Britain, its overseas territories, and the Commonwealth in general. Eventually, the first, and then the second Brabazon Committee would culminate in the drawing up of specifications for the construction of seven new aircraft designs after the war. The Brabazon Committee is a complicated and deeply interesting topic, at least as far as aviation is concerned, and it's definitely something that will be covered in its own video, but for now we will only focus on the bit that affects today's featured aircraft. The Type 4 aircraft specification from the committee was the most advanced, and it called for the design and construction of the world's first jet airliner, which would eventually evolve into the DH-106 Comet. In the earliest stages of the design process, the 106 was originally intended to be a tailless aircraft. The concept of the original design was so advanced that de Havilland had to design and develop both the airframe and the engines, and it was the development of the airframe that led to the DH-108. Unsurprisingly, de Havilland was reluctant to stick 36 passengers in such a radically new design without prior experimentation, and so, in October of 1945, a scale model of the design was ordered, one that would be used for testing to find any potential problems with aerodynamics, hull stresses, and to learn some of the techniques required for high-speed jet-powered flight. The result was the DH-108, and this mini-comet was given the unofficial nickname of Swallow. The development of the Swallow was covered under Air Ministry specification E18-45, which was drawn up in January of 1946. This required the construction of two airframes for conducting full-scale experiments on high-speed flights with swept-back wings, to evaluate aerodynamic and structural forces experienced during high-speed flight, and to act as an approximately half-scale version of the proposed multi-engine jet airliner that would become the Comet. De Havilland designer John Frost was put in charge of the project. By this point, he had gained valuable experience in the design and production of jet aircraft, having worked on the team that developed Britain's second jet-powered fighter, the DH-100 Vampire. As this aircraft was already tried and tested, the Swallow was directly developed from it. It made use of the fuselage and power plant of the Mark I version of the Vampire, the power plant being a de Havilland Goblin II, the tail booms were removed, and the wings were replaced with ones that had a sweep back of 43 degrees. The two swallows ordered under the specification were built from two existing Vampire airframes. These were being built on the production line operated by English Electric. The first airframe was given the new registration of TG-283, and the second was given TG-306, but to save me repeating serials half a dozen times in a five minute window, I shall simply refer to them as Swallow 1 and Swallow 2. After being delivered to Hatfield in September of 1945, work on converting Swallow 1 from a regular vampire into its experimental layout began. The original vampire fuselage pod was extended rearwards to make room for the vertical fin. The pod had been built in wood, but the new additions to the airframe, the rear fuselage and the fins, were all made from light alloys. The swept wing used a main spar, plus auxiliary front and rear spars, and it also housed extra fuel tanks, to offset the change in dimensions affecting the fuel consumption. Swallow 1 was designed to investigate low speed handling. For this, it had wooden Handley Page slats that ran the full span of the wing leading edge and over the air intakes. 
This restricted its maximum airspeed to approximately 280 miles an hour, or 450 kilometers an hour. Though some sources conflict and claim it could actually go as fast as 350 miles an hour. As it was designed to test stalling, the risk of uncontrolled spinning was duly appreciated. Special anti-spin parachutes were installed to combat this, being fitted to the wingtips, though as we will see later on, their effectiveness was questionable. The second Swallow also had slats built into the wings, but these were retractable and operated automatically as a safety feature as this aircraft was designed for high-speed testing. Converting the aircraft from vampires to their experimental specifications was completed in rapid time, and on the 15th of May 1946, Swallow 1 flew for the first time, taking off from a secluded airfield at Woodbridge with Jeffrey de Havilland Jr. at the controls. After proving that the hastily converted vampire could indeed fly, it was then taken to Hatfield for manufacturer trials. Not long after this, the second Swallow was ready for its first flights as well. It first flew as a normal de Havilland vampire in February of 1946, but that was only to take it to Hatfield for its conversion works. After these were complete, again done in a record time that probably should have raised several safety concerns, it took off in its experimental swept wing form in June. This aircraft was used to assess the high speed characteristics of the swept wings, and during its initial trials, progress was rapid, though not without some concern. In many flights, the pilots began to encounter compressibility at air speeds of 340 miles an hour at 35,000 feet, which resulted in a phenomena known as MACTUCK. This was a tendency for the nose to pitch down as the plane approached its critical Mach number. This was not unexpected, and with pitch correction, the pilots found it relatively easy to maintain control. However, the aircraft was only put near its critical Mach number at higher altitudes, as it was thought that the pitch oscillation caused by Mach Tuck would be increased at lower altitudes where the air was denser. As the tests continued, the high-speed performance of the second Swallow began to exceed expectations, so much so that it was decided to have a go at breaking the world air speed record, which was currently held by a Gloucester Meteor that clocked in at 616 miles an hour or 991 kilometers an hour. And this is where the Swallow's story begins to turn sour. On the evening of the 27th of September, during one of the trial flights made in preparation for the record attempt, Jeffrey de Havilland Jr., who was flying the Swallow high over the Thames estuary, took the plane into a shallow dive from 10,000 feet. During this dive, the Swallow reached an estimated speed of Mach 0.87, and it was here that it suffered a violent pitch oscillation that caused the aircraft's wing spars to crack and fail at the roots, which of course led to the wings folding back as if they had been snapped like those off a toy in the hands of a heavily handed child. I talked about Critical Mac in our recent video on the Bell X1. What happened here was that the air flowing directly over the wing was already at supersonic speeds, even though the plane was not. The shockwave caused by this forced the airflow away from the control surfaces, which at first reduced the effectiveness of the elevators, then it went on to cause a reversal of pitch, a nose down change in trim, and a severe reduction of longitudinal control. All of this culminated in the destruction of both the aircraft and the death of de Havilland Jr., which was a tragic loss for the company. The exact cause of the crash was not known until extensive wind tunnel tests on several models gave the full picture. However, despite the loss, the value of the second Swallow as a high-speed aircraft had been established, and a third prototype was ordered and completed, being registered as VW120, but I shall just refer to it as the Swallow 3. This model featured several major changes over the first two Swallows. It had a more pointed nose, a stronger airframe, reinforced wing roots, for obvious reasons, a more powerful Goblin 4 engine, powered control surfaces, and fully automatic leading edge slats. This sleeker, more aggressive looking Swallow flew for the first time on the 24th of July 1947. It made its public debut at the SBAC Air Show at Radlett in September of the same year, 
And following this, it was put into a series of high-speed trials, as well as entering for several speed record attempts, of which on the 12th of April 1948, it set a new 100 km closed circuit speed record with an average speed of 605 miles an hour. However, there were still some problems. Flights at high speed and altitude revealed a loss of roll control at Mach 0.99 and a severe reduction of pitch control at Mach 0.97. Eager to avoid another public tragedy, de Havilland imposed Mach limits on the aircraft until it could engineer a solution. These limits appear to have been completely ignored when, on the 6th of September 1948, test pilot John Derry put the aircraft in a dive from 45,000 feet. During this dive, the aforementioned control issues made their appearance, and he lost control though thankfully he was able to regain control again at 23,000 feet. During this chaotic descent, a speed of between Mark 1.02 and Mark 1.04 was recorded, which meant that the DH-108 Swallow had become the first British aircraft to break the sound barrier, albeit whilst out of control. Not long after this, it then became the first British aircraft to go supersonic while under actual pilot control, as well as being the first supersonic plane in the world that could take off and land under its own power. The Bell X-1 may have broken the sound barrier first, but it was air-launched to save fuel. On the 11th and 12th of December that year, the record-breaking plane was displayed to the public at the Farnborough Air Show, and then the following year it went to the Royal Aircraft Establishment to join the first Swallow, which had been quietly completing its slow-speed handling tests. Those who flew the Swallows almost unanimously found them to be difficult to control, bordering the line of being too dangerous in general to even consider flying. One of the test pilots who flew the third Swallow, Captain Eric Brown, was severely critical of its handling. It had a nasty tendency to stall suddenly, catching out even the most experienced pilots, and its tendency to oscillate violently at high speeds caused him to label the aircraft as a killer. His words would turn out to be prophetic. On the 15th of February 1950, the third Swallow crashed at Brick Hill near Bletchley after the test pilot, squadron leader Stuart Muller Rowland, lost control. The aircraft had performed a high speed descent from 27,000 feet and it had broken up below 10,000 feet. Witnesses recall it spinning violently out of control, one wing having snapped off before crashing into a wood. Initially, it had been thought that the loss of control was due to a fault in the oxygen supply system that had incapacitated the pilots, but later on further investigations pointed to a failure in the left wing spar as the ultimate cause. This left the original, and now singular, DH-108 Swallow to be used as a dedicated low-speed research aircraft. This it did for about three months until it too was destroyed in an accident. During a stalling trial at 15,000 feet, the aircraft entered an uncontrolled inverted spin. The anti-spin parachutes that were meant to save it failed to function properly, and the test pilot, squadron leader George Genders, or Genders depending on how I'm meant to be pronouncing this, prepared to bail out. But at around 2,000 feet, he made a partial recovery, only to lose control again moments later. This time he did bail out, but his parachute failed to deploy due to the low altitude, and he was killed. Despite their tragic safety record, something that was not at all uncommon in those early years of high-speed jet aircraft, the de Havilland 108s achieved a number of firsts for British aviation. For Britain, they would be the first swept-wing aircraft, the first tailless jet aircraft, and the first supersonic aircraft. That being said, the loss of the second Swallow did convince de Havilland to go with a less radical design for their multi-engine jet airliner. Though, in a cruel twist of irony, the de Havilland Comet will also become infamous for its tendency to disintegrate during flight, albeit for different reasons. The man behind the ill-fated Swallow, John Frost, moved to Canada not long after he completed the initial design work in 1947. 
and here he would continue to work on some very interesting designs, which included the UFO-like Avro car. But that's a story for another day. As always, thank you all very much for watching, and a special thank you, of course, to the patrons. With a special shout out to Kevin, Deliado, Bain, FB, Christopher R, Tronathon, and Eric Heinemann for their support as Wing Commander tier patrons. Thank you all so much, and I'll catch you all next time. Goodbye.